Today is the day. Tribals, battles, and darings. Hmm. Finally. And this is all being done. The book with all the pictures, everything should go in on Friday. It's been held up because the pictures have been being getting. And they have been found, thanks in large part to my good friend Drakenfanel. So um he's going to be owed a big, big thank you. And probably a large box of chocolates and some crate of iron at some point. You know how to say thank you. Iron brew. Right, so this is part one. Tribals, battles, darings, the back pocket of cruisers, tribals. So what are back pocket cruisers? Why do I go about it? Well, the Royal Navy was the representative of what was a global power. Not only was Britain a global power, it was a global maritime power. And it was the preeminent maritime power, and that was what provided it with its global power, with its status in the world. As such, it needed a lot of ships for the presence mission in peacetime, and for the economic warfare and other duties that a cruiser fulfills in wartime. So, peacetime, presence, wartime, everything. That's what a cruiser does. And it's important to understand the role of a present ship and what it's supposed to be as when we're talking about these classes. Because for a ship to be a good presence ship, a good cruiser in peacetime, it has to be powerful enough to have bearing. It has to be large enough to have bearing and hold diplomacy events and sort of impactful enough in design. But ideally, it is not so powerful that its loss constitutes a major threat to your national power. Or alternatively, that its presence is so overwhelming it turns from being a... We're taking notice. We see what's going on here. We see you. We understand. Just calm down to being a... We're coming in all guns blazing. You need ships for those roles. You do. But they're higher up the food chain, so to speak. They're supposed to deploy. If the cruiser, the present ship, doesn't work, that's when they turn up. I, If you don't listen to the walking very softly, but carrying a fair, a decent stick, you get the walking slightly less softly, carrying a far bigger stick arriving. We can all talk, you can debate the ethics and moralities of it, but it does work. Um, especially when you're dealing with a certain type of nation or ruler. And sometimes, even when you're not. Anyway, Tribals, Battles, Darings, the Back Pocket class, Back Pocket Cruisers. So, Britain had a problem. It depended on cruisers. It needed a lot of them. And it couldn't afford to buy as many as it needed, even without the limitation of the treaty. Cruisers are expensive, as we'll be getting into. And if your cruisers are expensive in peacetime, and they can take up tonnage in your treaty allowance, and you're not going to get enough. You need to find other ways of getting enough. And that means we come to a gentleman called Admiral Henderson, third sea lord of the 1930s, the man who was charged with working out how to square a circle. And he did quite a good job. He really did. But before we get into that, Bilge Pumps has arrived! Again! The new stream is set up. The first one on the new stream went out yesterday, Wednesday. And the second one will go out tomorrow. That's Friday. And there'll be another two next week. And there might well be another two the week after, depending on how many recordings we get done. Um, so I hope you enjoy them. I'm loving them. 
I think the whole Bill Trump's crew is loving them. Um, could I have picked any other Bill Trump's meme for today? No tribal lost its bow in the production of this podcast, but possibly some tribals did lose their or tribal did lose their bow for the as part of the um, creation of certain sources for this PowerPoint <laughs> or video recording. But no, Bill Trump's is a lot of fun. I get it. So we get to discuss a lot of stuff that you know. I'm speaking for myself here, but there isn't really that many opportunities for me to sit down and discuss with other people. You know, it's uh, it's interesting to discuss with three uh, three of us who have such similar levels of knowledge and depth of reading and of thinking about it that we can discuss it. It's going to be really interesting when we get some guests in it eventually in time. Um, it's going to be quite fun having some guests along, but at the moment it's just the crew. Right, so Admiral Reginald Henderson. I know he was technically a Vice Admiral for most of the period as Third Sea Lord, but he was promoted to Admiral. He is deserving of it. He dies in post. And frankly, he squares the circle. He squares the circle in a way which few of us could. This is the man who declared the HMS Unicorn wasn't an aircraft carrier with a straight face. And managed to get her built as such. Uh, he was the man who managed to sort out quite a lot of the cruiser issues that the Royal Navy was having. And a lot of the destroyer issues. And some of the sloop issues. Putting in place a lot of the things which would be critical for the Royal Navy Model 2. I would argue the most critical thing, though, he does isn't the armoured carrier programme. It's not the light fleet carrier programme, which comes from HMS Unicorn. No, I would argue the most critical thing he does is free the destroyer from being perceived as simply a rather large torpedo boat with guns. He starts at making it possible for a destroyer to be considered for other duties and still be called a destroyer. And most importantly, he it's without him, the tribal class would not exist. Simply put, the idea of trying to make smaller and smaller cruisers that could still live up to the cruiser sensibility of how you perform the cruiser duties was a prevalent idea. But it just wasn't practical. You still couldn't get enough ships. And honestly, the little cruisers... For all they did in World War Two, and you've got to love the Arafusa class, they do so much. They're a bit of a waste of treaty tonnage when you compare them to what some extra town class cruisers might have got you if you'd been able to build more of these little things to take the little cruiser duties on. And that's the thing. It's what are you using tonnage for, and how does that reflect your way of war, and how you are going to achieve your way of war. So, the tribal class. 27 vessels are purchased. They have a cumulative price of near, just under 14 million. <laughs> and a unit price averaging of 513,412 pounds. Uh, any admirals, procurement, defence ministers, etc., who are watching this, who are currently crying into their, I'm hoping, glass of something cold. Unfortunately, I've run out of both water and ivory right now. Um, I'm sorry. Inflation is a cruel, cruel mistress. That's just what happens. This compares to the K-Class Destroyer, which averaged around £500,000, so they, they're a bit cheaper. Or the Dido-Class Light Cruisers, which of course famously came from the same study, which were £1.48 million each. Ouch. And that was a small cruiser. <clears throat> Yep. Um, 
Displacement was built in line with the treaty maximum of 1,850 tons, but actually varied between 1,959 tons standard and 2,519 tons deep. And in the nicest way, there are very few ships which actually were 1,959 tons standard. The average was a little bit higher than that. Overall length, this you need to look at consider, is 377 feet, 36 foot 6 inches for beam, and 11 foot 3 inches for draft. And I do realise draft has been spelt the American way, and I apologise for that. It's supposed to be D-R-A-U-G-H-D, -D, and I'm sure it is in everywhere else. <laughs> oh, this is why you should just copy and paste from your book, Alex, rather than copy uh, uh, rather than handwrite it out. My notes are here, though. They are chapters one, four, and six of my book. So, you know, they're here. What's interesting, for engines which are theoretically in terms of fitted up for destroyer, so to give it high speed, that's why they can achieve 36 knots, which is 4 knots faster than either the Arafuser or Dido class light cruisers, uh, they have a range of 5,700 nautical miles at 15 knots. Now, compare this to the Dido's and the Arafuser class. Honestly, the Dido's are technically supposed to be 5,500 at 16 knots, so maybe at 15 knots they do get to that 5,700. And the Arafusa class, which are closer to proper cruisers, in my opinion, than Dido's, are um, 6,500 nautical miles at 16 knots. Which is pretty cool. That's quite a nice range for a little baby cruiser. And, you know... Those are good ships, but the tribal class does compare favourably to them, and that you have to be quite thankful for, considering some of their duties they get to. Of course, the picture is of HMS Cossack returning from something which is definitely a normally a cruiser duty, that is, economic warfare, in this, ter in this case, um, prevention of enemy uh, commerce raider, or in this case, commerce raider supply ship, getting home. By invading Norwegian territorial waters, going up a fjord and expressly forbidden by the Norwegians, um, having a tussle with the Altmark, um, in which ca their case there is a boarding action where the sailors literally do some of them swing across in on ropes straight out of the Pirates of the Caribbean. There is a debate as to whether or not any of the boarding crew were carrying cutlasses or not. My point is, is sometimes on that is that whilst I think it's unlikely any of the destroyer officers, considering their style, would have been doing so, there was a healthy leavening of cruiser officers aboard and cruiser personnel from uh, to for help form some of the boarding parties from a cruiser which had been struck down by illness and therefore the, its healthy crew had been put amongst the ships for boarding parties. Um, and that cruiser officers are wedded in this period to their swords like, there are so many things I could say wedded to, to like, but I will say um, wedded to their swords like I am to Iron Brew. You know, it's just, it's part of who they are and what they are. So maybe there was, maybe there wasn't. Most of the accounts I read, people say, I didn't see any of the, my crew going across with them. And you're sort of going, well, that's specific, a very specific. You didn't see any of your destroyer mates going across with them. But there were also cruiser bods in there, and the cruiser bods went across one section, and the destroyer bods went across another section. So you could be looking back, and you could see. Anyway, anyway that's a debate which we can have another day. Well, the point is, she's coming back from a cruiser duty. She is absolutely beautiful. I would have put on some Pape um, filming of her, and of HMS Nubian being launched as part of this. But it was £300 for 24 seconds of the, pa of the Nubian one, and a bit more than that for 28 seconds of HMS Cossack returning from the Altmark incident. So I'm sorry you're putting up my, my description. The Altmark incident is interesting because, as I've covered in other videos, especially when good guys go bad, um, the whole scenario would have played out very differently if you tried to use a cruiser in this cruiser role. I doubt it could have manoeuvred into the fjord as well. I think it would have probably end up being bashed. 
And there is also a slight advantage for the Norwegians in that because the tribal class are technically a destroyer, it's not as insulting as a very large cruiser coming in. It's not quite as big a footprint of um, territorial invasion. And they got back a whole load of sailors. This is the point. They weren't going in there just to violate Norwegian neutrality because they wanted to. She was Altmark was carrying a whole load of sailors from the, taken by the Grass Bay prisoner, which she hadn't declared to Norwegian Norwegian authorities, which they suspected strongly were on there. And you know, it's two wrongs. They don't make a right, but they do make a sort of scenario which is understandable. <sighs> They're just so pretty, and everything's lined out so nicely. They are. Anyway. So, we open chapter one. Now, um, interestingly enough, the actual design study, which leads to these, uh, the, these, these um, travels and the didos, um, Started in 1933 by the then Third Sea Lord and Controller, Admiral Sir Charles M. Forbes. It was looking for a new light cruiser. It runs into trouble, though. It runs into um, some words by Admiral Sir William Wordsworth Fisher, uh, uh, the Commander-in-Chief of Mediterranean, and various other people. Pretty much the Mediterranean staff and several of the officers, um, of senior officers, don't like the idea of a large destroyer. They see destroyers as torpedo ships. They drop torpedoes and attack the enemy with their torpedoes. And you're losing torpedoes for guns. Why? Why? Point is, it's a cruiser roll. When Tata returned to harbour, I packed my few belongings, said goodbye to my hosts and to Abel Seaman Kelly, who I had happened to pass on the quarterdeck, and climbed down the gangway to the boat. I saw my ship for the first time alongside an oiler. She was a fine-looking vessel, with sloping bows and gracious lines. Her main arms of 4.7-inch guns stood out boldly against the evening sky. The white ensign fluttered at her mainmast. I thanked God then that I had not been appointed to a drifter or a trawler, as many of my messmates at King Alfred and Portsmouth had been. Here was a ship built to attack. Here was here were power and majesty and beauty, sleek sharp lines and wicked looking guns, bows uh, which could cut through the water like scissors through paper, a streamlined bridge from which to command and to control the power of 44,000 horse, a midship's water tubes housing the tin fish, those sinister weapons which sped through the water at 40 knots and approached their target unseen and often unheard. That is Ludovic Kennedy, by the way, talking about when he was appointed HMS Tartar. You can see the 4.7 inch guns quite clearly. There is a slight problem with them. They are, in the nicest way, they are designed and put designed in a time and mounts chosen in time when the belief was. And interestingly enough, this is a concession Henderson made to get them built. The belief was that the things being attacked would be the aircraft carriers, the battleships, and enemy aircraft would ignore destroyers, so they would just have to use their guns to defend aircraft against the aircraft attacking the bigger ships. Of course, that turned out to not to be true. Would have been interesting if the uh, 4.7 or 4.5 general mount, which was being developed at the time, had been used in them. It, they weren't really quite ready, so it would have been might have delayed the tribal class a bit, which would have probably made him unhappy. But there is also a chance that they could have been the design. It could have been sped up if someone had really wanted to use it for his um, favorite pet project. In fact, he was using it for both his, it would have been using it for the 4.5 inch for both his pet projects, his aircraft carrier designs and his destroyers. What's interesting is also that the um, 
Rear Admiral Destroyers of the Mediterranean Fleet, Andrew Cunningham, uh, pretty much also decides to be against the idea of a large destroyer, right up until he gets them under his command when he becomes their biggest lover. Basically, they get used for everything. Every time he has a wacky idea in the Mediterranean, it's, where's the nearest tribal I need it for it? Um, what was also interesting was that this is being put forward as an 1850-ton design. Um, most of the admirals on this discussion are trying to put forward for a 4,500-ton cruiser design. Roughly an Oglas, therefore, with what was the C and the D class. And to an extent, the E-class cruisers. Um, but that wasn't really going to work. That wasn't really what was necessary, and you couldn't build enough of them on the tonnage. You couldn't build enough of them that could fight on the tonnage, because the problem with building a cruiser is you build a cruiser, it has to be able to fight the other guy's cruisers, or it's no point as building. It's not a cruiser. So you can build a really, really light vessel and call it a cruiser, which is within the cruiser tonnage, but it won't be a cruiser because it won't be able to fight any other cruiser. The point was, these were built on destroyer tonnage, and they could take on cruisers. Thanks in part to their guns, but mostly in fact to their the maneuverability and their torpedoes, and the attitude they were going to have. They were literally would have a very, very bad attitude for anyone to take them on. In fact, in 1936, the tactical school summed up the uh, intended combat roles of the tribal classes. Tribals will be used to supplement cruisers in reconnaissance and screening duties, including screening of aircraft carriers, and as support for the destroyers in the opening the way for torpedo attack. They may also be used for shadowing at night and to supplement the anti-aircraft fire of battleships. One trial will forming a stern of each battleship when air attack is anticipated. They're critical. And they are very, very cute. I'm sure I've said before. But, you know, the fact is there are 27 built overall, but 16 are built for the RN's two flotillas, and those are the main focus of my book and the main focus of this presentation. Principally because I haven't been able to get to Australia and Canada to look through the archives in person, and I therefore would not like to pass judgment on those ships before I had the opportunity to do so. Although I will say, HMCS Haida, I am so jealous of Ontario. Hamilton, Ontario has such an advantage in the world. So, eventually X-Mount, which is the second from rear, you can see in this picture, is replaced by a 4-inch high-angle gun to try and fix the problem of anti-aircraft fire, because it said they were designed to fire above aircraft, which went past them. And alongside that, there were a range of measures adapted to various parts of their own gunnery. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> the uh, guns on the tribals could were very, very adapted. They would get radars, they would get all sorts of things fitted as war went on, and um, they were adapted, and their crews were also would improvise and improve them. They had a lot of work put into these ships as wars went on, mainly because they had the space to do it. And the crew were very proud of their ships. Right, these are the 16 built, and I'm going to have to expand that, so you're going to have to see me disappear for a second. For the Royal Navy. Right then, so we have a Freedy, one of the most often forgotten, Cossack, Gurkha, Maori, Mohawk, Nubian, Zulu, Sikh, Eskimo, Mashona, Somali, Tata, Matabale, Punjab, Ashanti, and Bedouin. Of those, only Nubian, Eskimo, Tata, and Ashanti would survive World War Two. Most of the re rest, in fact, all the rest would be lost before the end of 1942, having taken part in so, so many different operations. 
that these are what they were built and who they were built by. As you can see, they were spread around. And some of those names were new to the Royal Navy. In fact, very new. Most of those one, the newest ones were put in the last set. So you have seven brand new names, nine reused names, which is, again, quite unusual, but it worked for this class. Sorry. You should never really get too emotionally attached as a historian to your subject matter. I don't to the people, but I find these ships very compelling. That's HMS Eskimo, for once with her bow. And she's showing off her colours, and you can see the markings of the Spanish Civil War. So that's the, what the colours on the V-turret uh, B-mount are for. And she does have mounts with shields rather than turrets, and there's a reason for this. It was felt that the amount of turret, the turret protection you could get in terms of the tonnage space a percentage allowed at the, design, at the time of designing would actually be more of a hindrance than a help. It couldn't provide more than protection against the weather, uh, but would, if they were hit by a enemy shell, actually contain some of the explosion and guarantee them being damaged. Whereas if you use the shield, just the shield and mount system, you A, had more space for the gun crew, you could manoeuvre the gun slightly easier and at the time, but more importantly, you could have thicker metal for the shield, so it could actually be a shield against something. And if it was impacted, the odds are, A, the shell, if it managed to penetrate it, would carry on straight going and maybe go over the side of the ship and go away from the crew. But also, if it did go off, there's more chance of the explosion being dissipated in the outer world. It's not much more of a chance, okay? It's not a lot of more of a chance, but it is a slightly better chance than the turrets they would have been able to fit. Look at that bow, though. These were ships designed from the get-go with presence. Presence was critical. If they were going to fill in for cruisers despite being destroyers, they had to have presence. Of course, she does like to lose her bow. That's HMS Eskimo post Narvik. Believe it or not, she gets back into service after that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's not doesn't take her out of the war at all. And actually, the more interesting thing is the Battle of Narvik is a really cool battle. Please, I've done a couple of videos about it, I think, now, where I've mentioned it. But in this case, she's leading some Royal Navy destroyers around the fjord, around the bend in the fjord in Norway. Not far from Narvik, surprising, considering the name. And there are some German destroyers on the other side, and uh, they're basically trying to defend themselves by keeping the British back, so they fire their torpedoes. She's coming around the corner. She's trying to fire her own torpedoes. She gets hit. B mount, which is, believe it or not, still intact above it. A mount and everything in front of it went goes. Basically dangles down, is gone. Crews wiped out everything. But B turret continue, a P mount continues firing, and she continues her turn, launches her torpedoes at the German destroyers, and then continue to starts to advance sternwards with X and Y turret leading on the firing, so she can continue to cover the other destroyers coming round the corner. Is there any wonder that the Germans decided to beach themselves rather than keep fighting? Frankly they weren't dealing with possibly the uh, people who understood the, the, the rules of war. Apply, uh, you know, The basic rules of war, if Val loses one's Val, one's pretty much out of the fight, do not apply to a tribal class destroyer, apparently. And that is Captain Philip Vian. He is famous because he was the per in charge of Cossack when she goes in to deal with the art mark. Um... Afridi is his normal flagship, but when she's sunk, he does move to Cossack. And when Afridi's in maintenance, he takes over Cossack. He is also a critical person in part of their other story when they're engaging the Bismarck, because he leaves his convoy without really orders to, and leaves him in the care of a C-class cruiser, which can only do air defense at this point, dashes across 
the Atlantic keeping um, emissions silence, finally gets noted orders, but his orders are specifically to um, meet up with the battleships which are trying to hunt down the uh, Bismarck because they are without escort. That doesn't really suit him. So instead, he manages to uh, he gets some a tip off from an RAF Catalina or Sunderland, one of them, and um, uses that to home in first on a, a, the cruiser, which is tailing the Bismarck at this point. But she's running out of fuel, and then he and his plucky four tribal class destroyers and ORP Purin, the uh, Polish destroyer, decide to, you know. Well, <clears throat> keep track on the uh, Bismarck all night long. They have fun. They uh, keep going in for the torpedo attack, because their idea of shadowing is, uh, we're going to keep harrying you torpedoes, and we might get to sink you before the battleships do. <sighs> Not a fun evening for the Bismarck. This is Eskimo again in Operation Pedestal. She didn't lose her bow this time. She did get some damage to it, but she didn't lose it. Um, I think... I'm not sure. Is it this operation? She gets her bow damaged a lot in World War II. Okay, most destroyers consider their bow an essential item. HMS Eskimo considers it, I don't know, some form of... extra weaponry. But this is Operation Pedestal, and this is what the destroyers were going along dealing with. They are def there to defend against air attacks. They are there to defend against surface attacks, submarine attacks. They are your general purpose tools, and these are the most general purpose of the general purpose. Interesting enough, like other, unlike other destroyer designs, which have had to lose often some of their torpedoes to get an AA weaponry, um, the Tribals, of course, had... A, plenty of space to increase their AA weaponry, and had already lost their um, torpedoes, for one set of torpedoes, for AA weapon or for extra guns. So, um, in many ways, they were the template for what the destroyer Model 2 would become. This is one of the most forgotten of the tribal class, HMS Matabale. She looks beautiful. Come on, that is a ship. Even in her war lines, she still looks good. They had to be very fast, the destroyers, and they were. So, there is going to, of course, be more later about tribal class destroyers. There's going to be the full live where I go through these pictures again and I'll discuss even more. But I wanted to do an introduction to each of the classes. I wanted to give you a bit of a background, a taste of it. And this is what we've got coming up today. Well, it's today. Today it's the back pocket cruisers done properly. I've just left that as the back pocket s because, frankly, I just find it funny. I still don't know how the cruiser disappeared. Um, patron video is next Monday. Remember, we're doing some Mondays and Thursdays, and so, uh, some Mondays. There are two Mondays in this month because of enough work commitments I have on Tuesdays. And I didn't want to drop one a week, and I couldn't do Wednesday night, Thursday night. I would just get on with it. I put a lot of this. So I'm going to do Sunday, Monday instead, for my sins. Wish me luck. I love brew ships, though. And brew ships this week is super pass. I haven't put all the videos up yet. I'm going to do that. Um, it's uh, from the sea. How naval powers get involved in land wars. And making Mare Nostrum a hollow jest. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So, and I'm rushing a bit because I can get this possibly done under the 35 minutes time. And that makes life a bit easier. Apparently more people watch the whole way through when it's 35 minutes or less on my videos. I was told that by YouTube stats today. So, um, Twitter, at AC underscore naval history. Patron, HC Naval History, and Global Maritime History. And all the links are down below, including the ones to the Discord. Thank you very much to my subscribers. Please do like and share, because it's really nice when I get lots of people watching, because this is something which is very important to my heart, close to my heart, and I want a lot of people to enjoy it, because I think it's going to be good. Anyway, 
thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this video and take care.